up to a grand final yourself and and how you take took in the day um building up to the game and a little bit after the game well we 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 sort of follow a relatively consistent routine because we go to every grand final um I, I think i've only missed two of the grand finals when i was when i've been away so i'm not able to be there um but we kind of go through a the same sort of routine uh, so it was a bunch of us 11 of us um family and friends met at in altringham um early in the morning i had a house full here um and then uh, we we went over to altringham to there's a market there that's got a fantastic food and drink venue so we got stuck into the beer and pizza early doors uh and then got the tram up to old trafford spent some time at the cricket ground which i thought which was they had a fan zone there and i thought that's the fan zone but apparently there's another one <laughs> where all the rest of the all the rest of the super league pod people were um so we had a couple of beers in there and then trotted off down to the ground i must i must admit i'm always more no i i quite often enjoy the days when saints aren't mm. there so more often recently than when they are. I enjoy so, the ones more when... where they're not there as well, David. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I obviously enjoy it when it goes right, but I've had plenty when it's not gone, not gone right, and it's a bloody miserable day when you go to Old Trafford and lose. So quite often it's a it's a better balance today when when your team's not in it. You can just concentrate on some rugby and beer. Um, uh, so we were pretty nervous going to the game. Um, I think we all felt we ought to win, but we all knew that Salford were going to give us a, a properly good uh, match. Uh, suspected had, that was going to be the case. Kind of, have the narratives kind of started to get to you as St Helens fans? Because it was oh, all the narratives been driving all build up. And... Yeah, I, I, I don't. That didn't worry me too much. I wasn't at all surprised by that. I, I, I felt think... like ours was the only preview show where me and Sarah probably talked more about St. Ellen's than we did about Salford, whereas every <laughs> other preview show talked way more about Salford. There you are. There you are. But, but, but that's because you the quality of the show, uh, Mark. But oh, I, I wasn't at all surprised. But it's a fa- fairy tale. It's a fairy tale thing, isn't it? So. Uh, uh, and I think rugby league needs these sort of stories. So I wouldn't. That didn't get to me. Didn't upset me at all. I think what was sort of ha- and has been, um, you know, concerning is the fact that we've consistently not got to finals, or indeed have recently got to a final and, and lost it. So the pressure was on. But do you think the, club, the Sulfur, you know, Do you think actually that's where the Salford storyline helped then? Because no one was talking about you lot being bottle jobs because everyone was talking about the amazing Salford journey. Yeah, well, maybe, but I, I think it would have just made it all the worse. I think <laughs> if we had lost, so <laughs> you know, it would have just been even worse uh, because it would would have been like Leicester City winning the winning the Premier League. Um, so. I, I I was I was concerned by that um, and an, and anxious about that and fed up to be honest of sort of the club being called bottlers and and so on and so forth and wanted to make sure that we you don't get these you never know when you're going to be in another grand final so I wanted to make sure we got we got what I thought we deserved from the rugby we played over the last couple of years um, and sort of got to take a big trophy. Uh, trophy home so anxious about that but uh, I was delighted to see the ground fill up Um, didn't know how many sulfur would bring didn't know how many neutrals would come to the game so to get 64,000 in there was great the atmosphere was very good we had some good chats to sulfur people on the way to the ground it was all very friendly you know the usual um, rugby league uh, crowd uh, was excellent. Uh, we had some great people around us in the ground, not people we knew, but there were some really good people around us in the ground. Um, and we really enjoyed the build-up to the game. I, I always love it uh, when they come out of the tunnel at the start. Uh, that's always that's always a great start to the game. And then and then we had the game itself, and I thought the game was terrific. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys thought, but I thought the quality of play from 
both teams actually was really really good uh, through the game we clearly Saints imposed the as they have been doing imposed themselves in terms of territory yeah uh, on the match um, you know we made it very difficult for Salford to get out of their own half for a lot of the first half uh, they eventually found a way once Saints got 12 nil up with an, an offload game that got them got them more meters down the field um but saints i thought so you know 25 minutes played there were one or two things but play, played pretty much a flawless flawless game um turning the ball over on their line and making them come out you know instead of risking getting seven tackle sets and stuff like that which which i thought was just very clever stuff um to Two, two very nicely worked tries, which sort of um, came really from all the pressure we'd had, I think, as much as anything. Yeah. They were starting to struggle to hold us at that stage. The, the over... We we got in the ground, what, about about 40 minutes or 45 minutes before kick-off, didn't we? Yeah, something like that. And we weren't, yeah. we weren't sure how much it was going to fill up next to us either. And, and Alan had taken the, t- the seat that was one seat in. And up until pretty <laughs> much two minutes before kickoff, that seat was empty, wasn't it? So it felt yeah. like we were going to have a bit of space. <laughs> and then this guy comes up the steps. <laughs> this massive guy. And I was like... <laughs> Oh God! He was—he was—he was a very chatty, boisterous Salford fan, though, wasn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, it was—it it, it, it was good—it was—it was good value. But yeah, I um, leg room is at a premium at Old Trafford at the best of <laughs> yeah. times. And I thought we were—I thought we were set for a, a nice little set up there. Because when I buy the tickets, I try and find the bit where there's a, a one going to be a one seat left on its own <laughs> situation. Ah. And unfortunately, it wasn't uh, to be, and it got taken up by this guy. <laughs> but he told us that apparently the two lads who'd lost out at the bookies were sat in front of us. Which, yeah, uh, oh, really? Yeah, just a bit, just oh, a bit further along, really? apparently. And there was some Salford fans who'd been to every game this season, some Salford fans who'd travelled distances that we saw on the day and stuff. So that was all really good. But yeah, in terms of the pattern of playing that first... I guess we've talked about the first 25 minutes there, haven't we? Um yeah. Really. In terms of the pattern of play in that first 25 minutes, the thing that stood out the most to me was Saints were playing the game so much faster. And it wasn't just dummy half scoots that was getting them that speed. You know, not like the old Leeds and Warrington, Tony Smith sides. It was... There was passing between forwards. There was wingers coming out of the backfield. There was kind of every different thing to get you up the field at, at great speed. And Salford, a lot of the times, weren't even getting back. Like, the ball had been played while Salford players were still retreating yeah. so many times in that first yeah. 25 minutes from our vantage point. That that was what yeah. I saw it as. And it just it wasn't a surprise when that Morgan Knowles try came. Um, yeah. Just because... Of... And there were two Salford two Salford players lying on the floor at the previous tackle, which was yeah. what caused the hole in the hole in the line. I'd I'd really like to know it's not something that anyone ever tracks, but I'd like to know how many times this year Saints have played the ball where at least one player has already is, is left on the floor. Because it seemed like every other tackle there was only yeah. ma- maybe one marker, maybe one guy retreating, maybe two guys left on the floor. You would just there weren't there wasn't a lot of offloading no. From Saints, no. you didn't need no. to because you were busting through the. You were kind of making a, as I said, you were. The, it seemed like the Saints player's head was always breaking through the other side of the tackle, and you would they yeah. were just hanging on for dear life. And yeah. I think Salford expended a huge amount of energy in that first kind of fifteen twenty minutes, just trying to hang on to you. To, to be honest, I, yeah, yeah, and, and I, 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 I think that's probably what won us the game in the end. To be honest, I think, I think Salford didn't have the energy in the second half because of the amount they'd had to extend uh, in, in sort of coping with the way Saints started the started the game. It was described in, the, uh, in a piece from the Mirror this morning as the white wall of wallop, which, <laughs> which, uh, which, I, quite, which I quite liked, uh, sort of pouring over Salford in that first 25 minutes. And, you know, I, I think they did, I, to be honest, I think they did remarkably well just to hang in there and, and keep themselves in the game. And, th- and then I think to the get only them thing find that was the energy to get back in, in it. The game was that you wasn't 
that you was doing that running it on the last play. I know yeah. what you're saying about the small in goal and the risk of a seven tackle set and, and that sort of thing, but yeah. I would have sort of thought you'd have come to a point where at least one kick had to go in to see if they caused an error. Of course, that did actually happen eventually. Um, yeah, it, and it did, and it ironically. Led, <laughs> it, it took 25 minutes for a last tackle kick, but when it came in, Salford struggled with it. An error was given yeah. away, and a scrum happened. Now, Alan, mm. this, yes. this, this, this scrum. I've got play, some strong views on this, by the way. We had, <laughs> we had kind of a, we were quite close to the scrum, weren't we? I suppose, relative to yeah. where uh, the rest of the action in the game, Alan. So, yeah, t- talk me through what you thought when we were watching this. Well, I, I, I'll be, I'll be brutally honest to you. I completely missed it. Um. And I was most confused because, because uh, much much like um, Salford's blind side, I was a bit I was a bit relaxed for a second. Um, <laughs> it's only really on replay that you see how beautiful this was. Um, clearly a planned move, clearly a training ground thing, um, and he, yeah. Uh, <sighs> It's my moment of the of the game. It was a, a thing of absolute beauty. And are we um, per- are we satisfied with ruling out any kind of huge concerns over the fact that actually it was against the the laws of the game what happened? <laughs> because oh, I've I never do, seen I, I, this sort of play. Like, well, this uh, move I, I mean, I've not I've... seen it executed, and it was executed to perfection. I thought between Roby yeah. and Tyre, it's Farge's role that's under question, isn't it? And is that what your strong views are, David? Yeah, Go well, on. I think I think my I think my view is the actual the innovative piece of this was the Tyre coming on the inside. Oh yeah, yes. I, I, so uh, stacking the stacking the open side, and then having a, a loose forward pick the ball up and have the scrum half run outside him is something that you see every team do, every game. So, uh, you know, I've seen every Super League team run that play where the loose forward comes out the back of the scrum, moves to the moves to the blind side with the scrum half and tries to attack down the blind side. And almost all teams are well-versed in trying to defend against that. Now... That might be again strictly against the rules of the game, but it's never pulled up. Well, that's not something I, I I've ever seen a penalty give for. If we're going to be finicky, in fifty years of watching say, the game, yeah. If we're going to be finicky, <laughs> and if we're going to say that the scrum half feeding the scrum has to immediately retire to behind the back of the scrum um, to to put himself back in the play, which is what the rule book says, then the defending scrum half should actually be closer to where the ball's going into the scrum and they should also yeah. immediately retreat to behind the back of their own forwards. Yeah. Two things that Tui Lola here didn't do. He was not stood close. Yeah. He was stood in line with the back row forward. Then he didn't go backwards. He came forwards too when the play was there. Yeah. So if we're calling out Theo Farge's role, then we call out both the roles and say reset the scrum, go again. Yeah. I don't know. But I would prefer yeah. to look at the moment of ingenuity and game planning and... And I've seen a couple of things that Holbrook's done in the playoff games, the one against Wigan as well, with the coot kick back on the inside, yeah. um, where obviously they've schemed something up for what they've been watching, and I just think it's fantastic and should be applauded. And that you know, this is the sort of stuff that when I watch something like the NFL and it's all about scheming and game planning and trying to find matchups, well, we don't. I don't think we see enough of it. Enough in our of game. that. And this yeah, was a moment, pure so. moment of scheming, drawing it up on a on a whiteboard and executing on the pitch. Yeah, cause, as I say, I think I think you see the first part of that play done by quite a lot of teams. I think the the innovative thing was having the the second rower break out of the scrum and come on the inside of the loose forward who was Roby on this this occasion, and then Roby executed his swivel pass perfectly to just give tire an easy run into the line and and it was it was beautiful and um uh i, I thought it was anyway and, and i would say that wouldn't i but i thought it was a beautiful play but um, after that play salford were able to start to get a little bit they did a field position that they finally had a set defending that where you didn't run over the top of them and, yeah. it, and it enabled them to find some field position eventually yeah 
And the first time that Salford had field position in this game, they found a way to cross the whitewash. 